Paddington, as almost everybody knows by now, was a small bear who came from darkest Peru and was found all alone on Paddington Station by Mr. and Mrs. Brown. That's how he came to be called Paddington. Well, the Browns took him home and he settled down to his new life in London with them and their two children, Judy and Jonathan, and their housekeeper, Mrs. Bird. According to the author of the stories, Michael Bond, Paddington had many remarkable adventures. Those you're going to hear now all come from the book Paddington at Large. I know I keep on saying it, exclaimed Mrs. Brown, as she placed an extremely large vegetable marrow on the kitchen scales, but I'm sure Paddington must have been born with green paws. Have you seen this one? He's beaten his best by over half a pound. Hmm, said Mrs. Bird. Well, I'll grant you one thing. Green paws are better than idle ones, and at least gardening keeps him busy. We haven't had an upset for weeks now. The Brown's housekeeper hastily touched wood as her eyes followed the progress of a small brown figure clad in a shapeless hat and an equally disreputable-looking duffel coat as it made its way down the garden path before disappearing into a potting shed behind the raspberry canes. Mrs. Bird was never very happy about any of Paddington's activities which took him out of her sight for too long at a time, and Paddington's interest in gardening had lasted much too long for her peace of mind. All the same, even Mrs. Bird had to admit that for some time past, things had been remarkably peaceful at Number 32, Windsor Gardens. It had all started when Paddington arrived home from the market one day carrying a giant packet of assorted seeds, which he'd bought for the bargain price of 5p. At the time, it seemed such good value for money that Mr. Brown had been only too pleased to let him have a corner of the garden, and for several evenings afterwards, Paddington had been kept very busy counting the seeds, making sure that none of them were stuck to his paws as he sorted them into separate piles in order of size before he planted them. Only Mrs. Bird had been full of forebodings. Woe betide the men in the shop if they don't all come up, she remarked, when she noticed the seed packet had been marked down from 25p. I can see there'll be some nasty scenes. But despite Mrs. Bird's misgivings, within a week or two, the first of the seeds began to sprout, and in no time at all, Paddington's patch was such a blaze of colour that it soon put the rest of the garden to shame. From that moment on, Paddington spent most of his spare time out of doors. And when he began supplying the household with vegetables as well as flowers, everyone had to agree with Mrs. Brown that he must have been born with green paws. I must say the garden is a picture at the moment, she continued, as she turned to help Mrs. Burb with the washing up. Even Mr. Curry called out this morning and said how nice it looks. If I know Mr. Curry, said Mrs. Bird, darkly, he was probably after something. He doesn't say things like that without a very good reason. Perhaps he wants some cheap vegetables, said Mrs. Brown. You know how mean he is. He'll be lucky with that bear, replied Mrs. Bird, and quite right too, seeing the state his own garden's in. It's a disgrace. Mr. Curry's lawn was very overgrown with weeds, and Mrs. Bird held strong views about the way the seeds blew over the fence whenever there was a strong wind. Funnily enough, said Mrs. Brown, I think he was just getting his lawnmower out when he spoke to me. Perhaps he's going to make a start. Not before time, snorted Mrs. Bird, and I shall believe it when I see it. He's much more likely to give the job to some poor bobber-job wheat scout than do it himself. Mrs. Bird gave the washing up several nasty jabs with her mop, but if she'd been able to see Mr. Curry as she spoke, she would probably have snorted even louder, for at that moment the Brown's neighbour was peering over the fence at Paddington with a very cunning expression on his face. Unaware of the danger he was in, Paddington was sitting on a patch of ground behind the raspberry canes, busy with his accounts. 
Mrs. Bird paid him strict market rate for all his vegetables, and although she kept a careful note of all his sales, Paddington wasn't the sort of bear to take chances, and he liked to make doubly sure by keeping his own record. He had just finished entering the words marrows, very large, one, in his notebook, when Mr. Curry's voice shattered the morning air. Bear! he roared. What are you doing, Bear? Resting on your laurels? Paddington jumped up in alarm at the sound of Mr. Curry's voice. Oh, no, Mr. Curry, he exclaimed when he recovered from the shock. I was only sitting on my begonias. Mr. Curry looked at him suspiciously, but Paddington returned his gaze very earnestly. The cunning expression returned to Mr. Curry's face as he looked round Paddington's garden. I'm glad to see you're all up to date, Bear, he said. I was wondering if you would like to earn yourself 5p if you've a few moments to spare. Er, uh, well, yes, please, Mr. Curry, said Paddington, doubtfully. From past experience, he felt sure that any job for which Mr. Curry was willing to pay 5p would take far longer than a few minutes, but he was much too polite to say so. Are you any good at climbing trees? asked Mr. Curry. Oh, yes, said Paddington, importantly. Bears are good at climbing things. That's good, said Mr. Curry, waving a hand in the direction of a large tree near his house. In that case, perhaps you'd like to pick a few apples for me. Thank you very much, Mr. Curry, said Paddington, looking most surprised at the thought of being paid 5p just for picking apples. Oh, and while you're up there, said Mr. Curry, casually, there's a dangerous branch that needs cutting down. I'm afraid I have to go out, but it's very kind of you to offer, Bear. It's very kind indeed. Well, before Paddington had time to open his mouth, Mr. Curry produced a saw and a length of rope from behind his back and pointed to the branch in question. Now, don't forget, he said, as he handed the bits and pieces over the fence, you tie one end of this rope to the branch, then you loop the other end over the top of the tree and tie it back down to something heavy on the ground. That's most important, otherwise the branch might fall down too quickly and cause a nasty accident. I don't want to come back and find any broken windows. And if you finish before I get back, continued Mr. Curry, perhaps you'd like to cut my grass. I've put the mower already, and if you make a good job of it, there might even be another 5p. With that, Mr. Curry turned on his heels and disappeared in the direction of the house, leaving Paddington anxiously holding the rope between his paws. He felt sure he hadn't said anything to Mr. Curry about cutting down his branches, let alone uttered a word about mowing the grass. But the Brown's neighbour had a way of twisting things so that other people were never quite sure what they had said. If it had simply been a matter of cutting the grass, Paddington might have pretended that he'd got something stuck in his ear by mistake and hadn't heard properly. But as he studied Mr. Curry's tree, he began to look more and more thoughtful. A few moments later, he jumped up and began hurrying around as he made his preparations. Paddington liked climbing trees, and he was also very keen on sawing. To be able to do both at the same time seemed a very good idea indeed, especially when it was in someone else's garden. All the same, as he looked round for something heavy to tie the rope to, he soon decided that it was easier said than done. The nearest object was Mr. Curry's fence, and that was so rickety, a piece of it came away in his paw when he tested it with one of his special knots. In the end, Paddington settled on Mr. Curry's lawnmower, which looked much more solid. And after making a double knot round the handle to be on the safe side, he began to climb the apple tree, armed with the saw and a jar of his favourite marmalade. Mr. Curry's apple tree was rather old, and Paddington didn't like the way it creaked. But at long last, he settled himself near the branch that had to be cut down, and after making sure the other end of the rope was properly tied, he dipped his paw in the marmalade jar and got ready for the big moment. Paddington was a great believer in marmalade. He'd often used it for all sorts of things besides eating 
and now he felt sure it might come in very useful for greasing the blade in an emergency. There weren't many teeth left, but of those that were still intact, most were rusty, and the rest stuck out at some very odd angles. Taking a final look round to make sure everything was as it should be, Paddington gripped the saw with both paws, closed his eyes, and began jumping up and down as he pushed it back and forth across the branch. In the past, he'd usually found any kind of sawing hard work, but for once, everything seemed to go smoothly. If anything, Mr. Curry's tree was in an even worse state than his saw, and within a few minutes of starting work, there came a loud crack, followed almost immediately afterwards by a splintering noise as the branch broke away from the tree. When the shaking stopped, Paddington opened his eyes and peered down at the ground. To his delight, the branch was lying almost exactly where he'd planned it to be, and he felt very relieved as he scrambled back down the tree to view the results of his... It wasn't often that any jobs he did for Mr. Curry went right first time, and he spent some moments sitting on the sawn-off branch with a pleased expression on his face while he got his breath back. Turning his attention to the lawn, Paddington began to wish more than ever he hadn't heard Mr. Curry's remark about cutting it. Apart from the fact there seemed to be an awful lot, the grass itself was so long it came almost up to his knees, and even when he stood up, it was a job to see where the lawn finished and the rest of the garden began. It was as he looked round for the mower in order to make some kind of start that Paddington received his first big shock of the day. For although there was a long trail leading down through the grass from the shed, and although there were two deep wheel marks to show where it had been left standing, Mr. Curry's lawnmower was no longer anywhere in sight. Paddington's shocks never came singly, and as he nearly fell over backwards with surprise at the first one, he promptly received his second. Rubbing his eyes, he peered upwards again, in the hope that it had all been part of a bad dream, but everything was exactly as it had been a few seconds before. If anything, it was worse, for having rubbed his eyes, he was able to make out even more clearly the awful fact that far from having disappeared into thin air, Mr. Curry's lawnmower was hanging as large as life from a branch high above his head. Paddington tried pulling on the rope several times, but it was much too tight to budge, and after a few more half-hearted tugs, he sat down again, with his chin between his paws and a very disconsolate look on his face as he considered the matter. Thinking it over, he couldn't for the life of him see a way out of the problem. In fact, the more he thought about it, the worse it seemed, because now Mr. Curry's lawnmower was up the tree, he couldn't even make amends by cutting the grass for him. Mr. Curry wasn't very understanding at the best of times, and from whatever angle Paddington looked at the tree, even he had to admit that it was one of the worst times he could remember. Paddington's very quiet this morning, said Mrs. Brown. I hope he's all right. He was poking around in Mr. Brown's garage about an hour ago, said Mrs. Bird, looking for some shears, but I haven't seen him since. If you ask me, there's something going on. I met him coming up the garden path just now with a spanner in his paw, and he gave me a very guilty look. A spanner, said Mrs. Brown. What on earth does he want with a spanner in the garden? I don't know, said Mrs. Bird grimly, but I have a nasty feeling he's got one of his ideas coming on. I know the signs. Almost before the words were out of Mrs. Bird's mouth, there came a series of loud explosions from somewhere outside. Gracious me, she cried as she rushed to the French windows. There's a lot of smoke behind the raspberry canes. And that looks like Paddington's hat, exclaimed Mrs. Brown, as a shapeless-looking object suddenly began bobbing up and down like a jack-in-the-box. Perhaps he's having a bonfire. He looks as if he's trodden on something hot. Hmm, said Mrs. Bird. If that's a bonfire, I'm a Dutchman. 
Mrs. Bird had had a great deal of practice at putting two and two together as far as Paddington was concerned. But before she could put her thoughts into words, the banging became a roar, and Paddington's hat, which had disappeared for a few seconds, suddenly shot up in the air, only to hurtle along behind the top of the canes at great speed. Any doubts in Mrs. Bird's mind as to what was going on were quickly settled as Mr. Brown's motor mower suddenly came into view at the end of the raspberry canes, carrying with it the familiar figure of Paddington as he held onto the handle with one paw and clutched his hat with the other. The mower hit Mr. Curry's fence with a loud crash and then disappeared again as quickly as it had come, leaving behind it a large hole and a cloud of blue smoke. If Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Burr were astonished at the strange turn of events in the garden, Paddington was even more surprised. In fact, so many things had happened. In such a short space of time, he would have been hard put to explain matters even to himself. Mr. Brown's motor mower was old and rather large, and although Paddington had often watched from a safe distance when Mr. Brown had started it up, he had never actually tried his paw at it himself. It had all been much more difficult than he'd expected, and after several false starts, he'd almost given up hope of ever getting it to go when suddenly the engine had burst into life. One moment he'd been bending over it, pulling levers and striking matches as he peered hopefully at the works, and the next moment there had been a loud explosion, and with no warning at all, the mower had moved away of its own accord. The next few minutes seemed like a particularly nasty nightmare. Paddington remembered going round the lawn several times as the mower gathered speed. He also remembered feeling very pleased that Mr. Curry had left his side gate open as he shot through the opening and out into the road. But after that, things became so confused he just shut his eyes and hoped for the best. There seemed to be a lot of shouting coming from all sides, together with the sound of running feet. Once or twice, Paddington thought he recognised the voices of Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird in the distance, but when he opened his eyes, it was only to see a large policeman looming up ahead. The policeman's eyes were bulging. He had his hand up to stop the traffic. Paddington just had time to raise his hat as he shot past, and then he found himself being whisked round a corner in the direction of Portobello Market, with the sound of a heavy pair of boots adding itself to the general hubbub. He tried pulling on several of the levers, but the more he pulled, the faster he seemed to go, and in no time at all, the noise of his pursuers became fainter and fainter. It felt as if he'd been running for hours. And suddenly, for no apparent reason, the engine began to splutter and slow down. As the motor mower came to a stop, Paddington opened one eye cautiously and found, to his surprise, that he was standing in the middle of the Portobello Road, only a few yards away from the antique shop belonging to his friend, Mr. Gruber. Whatever's going on, Mr. Brown? cried Mr. Gruber as he came running out of his shop and joined the group of street traders surrounding Paddington. I, I think I must have pulled the wrong lever by mistake, Mr. Gruber, said Paddington, sadly. Good job for you, your hat fell over the carburetor, said one of the traders who knew Paddington by sight. Otherwise there's no knowing where you might have ended up. It must have stopped the air getting in. What? exclaimed Paddington, anxiously. My hat's fallen over the carburetor. Paddington's hat was an old and very rare one, which had been given to him by his uncle shortly before he left Peru, and he felt very relieved when he saw that apart from a few extra oil stains, there was no sign of damage. If I were you, said someone in the crowd, nodding in the direction of a group of people who had just entered the market, if I were you, I'd make yourself scarce. The law's on its way. With great presence of mind, Mr. Gruber pushed the motor mower onto the pavement by his shop. Quick, Mr. Brown, he cried, pointing to the grass box, jump in here. Mr. Gruber barely had time to cover Paddington with a sack and chalk today's bargain on the outside of the box before there was a commotion in the crowd and the policeman elbowed his way through. Well, he demanded, as he withdrew a notebook from his tunic pocket and surveyed Mr. Gruber. Where is he? Where is he? repeated Mr. Gruber, innocently. 
the young bear that was seen driving a motor mower down the Queen's Highway a moment ago, said the policeman, ponderously. Out of control he was, and heading this way. A young bear, said Mr Gruber, carefully placing himself between the policeman and Mr Brown's mower. Driving a motor mower? What sort of bear? Dressed in a duffel coat that's seen better days, replied the policeman, and wearing a funny kind of hat. I've seen him around before. Mr. Gruber looked about him. I can't see anyone answering to that description, he said gravely. The policeman stared long and hard at Mr. Gruber and then at the other traders, all of whom carefully avoided catching his eye. I'm going for a short walk, he said at last, with the suspicion of a twinkle in his eye. And when I get back, if I see a certain um, bargain still outside a certain person's shop, I shall make it my duty to look into the matter a bit further. As the crowd parted to let the policeman through, Mr. Gruber mopped his brow. That was a narrow squeak, Mr. Brown, he whispered. I hope I did the right thing. Not knowing the facts, I didn't know quite what to say. That's all right, Mr. Gruber, said Paddington, as he peered out from under the sacking. I'm not very sure of them myself. Mr. Gruber and the other traders listened carefully while Paddington went through the morning's events for their benefit. It took him some time to relate all that had taken place, and when he finished, Mr. Gruber rubbed his chin thoughtfully. First things first, Mr. Brown, he said briskly, as he locked the door to his shop. It sounds as though you'll need a hand getting Mr. Curry's lawnmower down from his tree before he gets home, so I think I'd better push you back to Windsor Gardens as quickly as possible. Unless, of course, you'd rather walk... Paddington sat up in the grass box for a moment while he considered the matter. I think, if you don't mind, Mr. Gruber, he announced gratefully, as he pulled the sack back over his head, I'd much rather ride. <laughs> Most mornings, when he wasn't busy in the garden, Paddington visited his friend, Mr. Gruber. And the day after his adventure with the motor mower, he made his way in the direction of the Portobello Road even earlier than usual. He was particularly anxious not to see Mr. Curry for a few days, and he agreed with Mrs. Bird when she said at breakfast that it was better to let sleeping dogs lie. Not that Mr. Curry showed much sign of sleeping. From quite an early hour, he'd been on the prowl, peering at the hole in his fence in the intervals between glaring across at the Brown's house. And Paddington cast several anxious glances over his shoulder as he hurried down Windsor Gardens, pushing his shopping basket on wheels. He heaved a sigh of relief when he at last found himself safely inside Mr Gruber's shop, among all the familiar antiques and copper pots and pans. Apart from a few grass cuttings stuck to his fur, Paddington was none the worse for his adventure, and while Mr. Gruber made the cocoa for their elevenses, he sat on the horsehair sofa at the back of the shop and sorted through the morning supply of buns. Mr. Gruber chuckled as they went over the previous day's happenings together while they sipped their cocoa. <laughs> he, hearing about other people's adventures always makes me restless, Mr. Brown, he said as he looked out of his window at the bright morning sun, particularly when it's a nice day. Have a good mind to shut up shop after lunch and take the afternoon off. Mr. Gruber coughed. Uh, I, wa I wonder if you would care to accompany me, Mr. Brown, he said. We could go for a stroll in the park and look at some of the sights. Oh, yes, please, Mr. Gruber, exclaimed Paddington. I should like that very much. Paddington enjoyed going out with Mr. Gruber, for he knew a great deal about London, and he always made things seem interesting. 
We could take Jonathan and Judy, said Mr. Gruber, and make a picnic of it. Mr. Gruber became more and more enthusiastic as he thought the matter over. All work and no play never did anyone any good, Mr. Brown, he said. And it's a long time since I had an outing. And with that, he began to bustle round his shop, tidying things up, and even announced that he wouldn't be putting his knick-knacks table outside that day, which was most unusual, for Mr. Gruber always had a table on the pavement outside his shop, laden with curios and knick-knacks of all kinds at bargain prices. While Mr. Gruber busied himself at the back of the shop, Paddington spent the time drawing out a special notice in red ink to hang on the shop door while they were away. It said, Important Announcement this shop will be closed for the annual staff outing this afternoon. After underlining the words with the remains of the cocoa lumps, Paddington carefully wiped his paws and then waved goodbye to Mr. Gruber before hurrying off to finish the morning shopping. When she heard the news of the forthcoming outing, Mrs. Bird quickly entered into the spirit of things and she made a great pile of sandwiches ham and two kinds of jam for Mr. Gruber, Jonathan and Judy and some special marmalade ones for Paddington. These, together with a tin of freshly made fairy cakes and some bottles of lemonade, soon filled Jonathan's rucksack to the brim. Sooner Mr. Gruber than me, said Mrs. Bird after lunch, as she watched the heavily laden party set off up the road, led by Mr. Gruber carrying a large guidebook and Paddington with his suitcase, opera glasses and a pile of maps. Paddington did say they were going to the park, didn't he? asked Mrs. Brown. It looks rather as if they're off to the North Pole. Knowing Paddington, said Mrs. Bird, darkly, perhaps it's as well they're prepared for an emergency. In Mrs. Bird's experience, an outing with Paddington was more likely than not to end up in some kind of disaster, and she wasn't sorry to be out of the way for a change. <laughs> say Mrs. Burr would have been hard put to find fault with the orderly procession which neared the park some while later, and even the policeman on point duty nodded approvingly when Mr. Gruber signalled that they wanted to cross the road. He at once held up the traffic with one hand and touched his helmet with the other when Paddington raised his hat as they went by. It had taken them quite a long time to reach the park, for there had been a great many shop windows to look in on the way, and Mr. Gruber had stopped several times in order to point out some interesting sights he didn't want them to miss. Although Paddington had been in a number of parks before, it was the first time in his life he'd ever seen a really big one. And as Mr. Gruber led the way through the big iron gates, he decided he was going to enjoy himself. Apart from the grass and trees, there were fountains, swings, deck chairs, and in the distance he could even see a lake shimmering in the afternoon sun. In fact, there was so much to see, he had to blink several times in order to make sure he was still in London. Mr. Gruber beamed with pleasure at the look on Paddington's face. It uh, might be an idea to go and sit by the lake, first of all, Mr. Brown, he said. Then you can dip your paws in the water to cool off while we have our sandwiches. Thank you very much, Mr. Gruber, said Paddington, gratefully. The hot pavements always made his feet tired, and the thought of being able to cool them and have a marmalade sandwich at the same time seemed a very good idea. For the next few minutes, Mr. Gruber's party was very quiet indeed, and the only sound, apart from the distant roar of the traffic, was an occasional splash as Paddington dipped his paws in the water, and the clink of a marmalade jar as he made some extra sandwiches, just to be on the safe side. When they'd finished their picnic, Mr. Gruber led the way towards a small enclosure where the swings and slides were kept, and he stood back while Paddington and Jonathan and Judy hurried inside to see what they could find. Paddington in particular was very keen on slides, and he was anxious to test a large one which he'd seen from a distance. It was when the excitement was at its height that Mr. Gruber suddenly cupped one hand to his ear and called for quiet. I do believe there's a band playing somewhere, he said. And sure enough, as the others listened, they could definitely hear strains of music floating across the park. 
It seemed to be coming from behind a clump of trees, and as Mr. Gruber led the way across the park, it gradually got louder and louder. Then, as they rounded a corner, another large enclosure came into view. At one end of it, there was a bandstand, and in front of that, there were rows and rows of seats filled with people listening to the music. Mr. Gruber pointed excitedly at the bandstand. We're in luck, Mr. Brown, he exclaimed. It's the guards. While Mr. Gruber went on to explain that the guards were a very famous regiment of soldiers who kept watch over Buckingham Palace and other important places, Paddington peered through the fence at the men on the platform. They all wore brightly coloured uniforms with very tall black hats made of fur, and their instruments were so highly polished they sparkled in the sun like balls of fire. It's a good many years since I went to a band concert in the park, Mr. Brown, said Mr. Gruber. I've never been to one, Mr. Gruber, said Paddington. That settles it then, replied Mr. Gruber. And as the item came to an end and the audience applauded, he led the way to the entrance and asked for four 5p tickets. They just managed to squeeze themselves into four seats near the back before the conductor, a very imposing man with a large moustache, raised his battle for the next item. Paddington settled himself comfortably in his seat. They'd done so much walking that day, he wasn't at all sorry to be able to sit down and rest his paws for a while, and he applauded dutifully and cheered several times when, with a flourish, the conductor at last brought the music to an end and turned to salute the audience. Judy nudged Paddington. You can see what they're going to play next, she whispered, pointing towards the bandstand. It's written on that board up there. Paddington? took out his opera glasses and leaned out into the aisle as he peered at the board with interest. There were several items called selections which he didn't immediately recognise. These were followed by a number of regimental marches, one of which had just been played. After that came another selection from something called a surprise symphony, which sounded very good value. But it was as he peered at the last item that a strange expression suddenly came over Paddington's face. He breathed heavily on his glasses several times, polished them with a piece of rag which he got from his suitcase, and then looked through them again at the board. That's called a selection from Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, explained Judy in a whisper as the music started up again. What? exclaimed Paddington hotly as his worst suspicions were confirmed. Mr. Gruber's paid 5p each for our tickets, and they haven't even finished it. He died a long time ago, whispered Judy, and they never found the rest of it. Five P each, exclaimed Paddington bitterly, not listening to Judy's words. That's twenty P. Shh, said someone in the row behind. Paddington sank back into his seat and spent the next few minutes giving the conductor some hard stares through his opera glasses. Gradually, as the music reached a quiet passage, everyone closed their eyes and began to sink lower and lower in their seats, until, within a matter of moments, the only movement came from somewhere near the back of the audience as a small brown figure got up from its seat by the gangway and crept towards the exit. Paddington felt very upset about the matter of Mr. Gruber's treat, and he was determined to investigate the matter. Here, said the man at the entrance, if you goes out, you won't be allowed in again. It's against the rules and regulations. Paddington raised his hat. I'd like to see Mr. Schubert, please, he explained. Schubert, repeated the man. He cupped one hand to his ear. The band had reached a loud passage and it was very difficult to hear what Paddington was saying. Yes, you'd better try over there, he exclaimed, pointing to a small kiosk. I believe they have some dabs. Dabs? exclaimed Paddington, looking most surprised. Yeah, that's right, said the man, but you'll have to look slippy, he called as Paddington hurried across the grass with an anxious expression on his face. Otherwise, I, I shall have to charge you another 5p. 
The lady in the kiosk looked rather startled when Paddington tapped on the side. Oh, oh dear, she said as she peered over the counter. One of them soldiers has dropped his busby. I'm not a busby, exclaimed Paddington hotly. I'm a bear, and I've come to see Mr. Schubert. Mr. Schubert? repeated the lady, recovering from her shock. I don't know of anyone of that name, dear. There's Bert, what seems to the deck chairs, but it's his day off today. She turned to another lady at the back. Uh, Do you know uh, Mr. Schubert Glad? she queried. There's a young bear gentleman asking after him. Sounds like one of them musicians, said the second lady doubtfully. They usually has fancy names. He wrote a symphony, explained Paddington, and he forgot to finish it. Oh dear, said the first lady. Well, if I were you, I'd go and wait under the bandstand. You're bound to catch them when they come off. Uh, There's a door at the back, she added helpfully. If you wait in there, it'll save disturbing all the people in the audience. After thanking the ladies for all their help, Paddington hurried back across the grass towards some steps which led down to a small door marked strictly private at the rear of the bandstand. Paddington liked anything new, and he'd never been inside a bandstand before. It sounded most interesting, and he was looking forward to investigating the matter. The door opened easily when he put his paw against it, but it was when he closed it behind him that he made the first of several nasty discoveries, for it shut with an ominous click, and try as he might, he couldn't pull it open again. After poking at it for several minutes with an old broom handle which he found on the floor, Paddington groped around until he found an upturned box, and then he sat down in order to consider the matter. Apart from the fact that it was dark inside the bandstand, it was also very dusty, and every time the band played a loud passage, a shower of dust floated down and landed on his whiskers, making him sneeze. In fact, the more Paddington thought about things, the more he thought something would have to be done. groaned Judy. I've never known such a bear for disappearing. Mr. Gruber, Jonathan and Judy had opened their eyes at the end of the piece of music only to discover that Paddington's chair was empty and he was nowhere in sight. He's left his fairy cakes behind, said Jonathan, so he can't have gone that far. Mr. Gruber looked worried. They're just about to play the surprise symphony, he said. I do hope he's back in time for that. Mr. Gruber knew how keen Paddington was on surprises, and he felt sure he would enjoy the item. But before they had time to discuss the matter any further, the conductor brought the band to attention with a wave of his baton, and quiet descended on the audience once again. It was when the band had been playing for about five minutes that a puzzled look gradually came over Mr. Gruber's face. It seems a very unusual version, he whispered to Jonathan and Judy. I've never heard it played like this before. Now that Mr. Gruber mentioned it, there did seem to be something odd about the music. Other people in the audience were beginning to notice it as well, and even the conductor was twirling his moustache with a worried expression on his face. It wasn't so much the way the music was being played as a strange thumping noise which seemed to be coming from the bandstand itself and which seemed to be getting louder every minute. Several times the conductor glared at the man who was playing the drums until, at last, looking most upset, the man raised his sticks in the air to show that he had nothing to do with the matter. It was at that moment that an even stranger thing happened. One moment, the conductor was standing in front of the band, glaring at the musicians. The next moment, there was a splintering noise, and before everyone's astonished gaze, he appeared to rise several inches into the air before he toppled over, clutching at the rail behind him. Crikey! exclaimed Jonathan, as a loud sneeze broke the silence that followed. I'd know that sneeze anywhere! Mr. Gruber... Jonathan and Judy 
watched with growing alarm as a board in the floor of the bandstand gradually rose higher and higher. And after some more splintering noises, a broom handle came into view and waved about in the air. A few seconds later, the broom handle was followed by a familiar-looking hat and some even more familiar-looking whiskers. Excuse me, said Paddington, raising his hat politely to the conductor. I'm looking for Mr. Schubert. Bears in my bandstand, spluttered the conductor. Thirty years I've been conducting and never once fallen off my podium, let alone been knocked off by a bear. Whatever else the conductor had been about to say was drowned in a burst of applause. First one person started to clap, and then another, until finally the whole audience was on its feet, applauding. They call it the Surprise Symphony, said a man sitting next to Mr Gruber, but I, I don't think I've ever been more surprised in my life than when that young bear came up to the floor. It's very good value for 5p, said someone else. What will they think of next? It was some while before the applause died down, and by that time the conductor had recovered himself, and he even began to look quite pleased at the way the audience was clapping. Very good timing, Bear, he said gruffly as he returned Paddington to his seat and gave him a smart military salute. <laughs> it would have done credit to a guardsman. All the same, said Jonathan, some while later as they were strolling home through the park, all the same, it's a jolly good thing someone started the clapping off, or there's no knowing what might have happened. I wonder who it was. Judy looked at Mr Gruber, but he appeared to be examining one of the nearby trees. And if there was a twinkle in his eye, it was hard to see. Lucky for some, exclaimed Mr Brown. Oh, don't tell me we've got to sit and watch that awful thing. Isn't there anything better on the other channel? The rest of the family exchanged uneasy glances. And Paddington did ask if we could have it on, said Mrs Brown. It's his favourite programme and he was so keen that we shouldn't miss it tonight. In that case, said Mr Brown, why isn't he here? I expect he's popped out somewhere, said Mrs Brown soothingly. He'll probably be back in a minute. Mr. Brown sank back into his seat with a grunt and stared distastefully at the television screen as a fanfare of trumpets heralded the start of Lucky for Some and the master of ceremonies, Ronnie Playfair, came bounding onto the stage, rubbing his hands with glee. I wouldn't mind, said Mr. Brown, if he asked sensible questions, but to give all that money away for the sort of things he asks, it's ridiculous. The dining room curtains were drawn and the Brown family, with the exception of Paddington, who had been unaccountably missing since shortly after tea, were settled in a small half-circle facing the television set in preparation for their evening's viewing. Over the past few weeks, a change had come over the routine at number 32 Windsor Gardens. Normally the Browns were the sort of family who entertained themselves quite happily, but since the arrival of the television set, practically every evening had been spent in semi-darkness as they sat with their eyes glued to the screen. All the same, although Mr Brown was the first to admit it out loud, the nine days' wonder of having pictures in their own home was beginning to wear thin, and there were several signs of restlessness as yet another fanfare of trumpets burst from the loudspeaker. I do hope nothing's happened to Paddington, whispered Mrs Brown. It's not like him to miss any of the programmes, especially a quiz. He's very keen on them. That bear's been acting strangely all week, said Mrs Bird, ever since he got that letter. I've a nasty feeling it may have something to do with it. 
Well, it can't be anything bad, said Mrs. Brown. He seems to have spent all his time with his whiskers buried in those encyclopedias of Mr. Gruber's. He even missed his second helping at lunch today. That's just it, said Mrs. Bird, ominously. It's much too good to be true. While Ronnie Playfair's face grew larger and larger on the screen as he explained the programme to the studio audience and the viewers at home, the Browns began to discuss Paddington's strange behaviour over the past week. As Mrs. Bird said, it had all begun when he'd received an important-looking letter by the first post one morning. At the time, no one had paid it a great deal of attention, for he often sent away for catalogues or any free samples which he saw being advertised in the newspapers. But a little later that same morning, he had arrived home pushing Mr. Gruber's encyclopedias in his basket on wheels, and the next day, after borrowing Mr. Brown's library tickets, another pile of books had added themselves to the already large one at his bedside. He's been asking the oddest questions, too, said Mrs. Brown. I don't know where he gets them from. Crikey! exclaimed Jonathan suddenly, as he jumped up from his seat and pointed at the television screen. No wonder he isn't here! Look! Gracious me! exclaimed Mrs. Bird, as she followed his gaze. It can't be! Mr. Brown adjusted his glasses. It jolly well is, he said. It's Paddington and Mr. Gruber. While the Browns had been talking, Ronnie Playfair had finished describing the workings of the programme. Waving his hand cheerily to the studio audience, he stepped down off the stage in the beam of a large spotlight and announced that the first contestant of the evening was a Mr. Brown of London. As he made his way up the aisle, the camera followed him and eventually came to rest on two familiar faces at the end of one of the rows of seats. Mr. Gruber's look of embarrassment was tinged with a faint air of guilt as he caught sight of his own face on a nearby screen. Although Paddington had assured him that the Browns liked surprises, he wasn't at all sure they would be keen on this particular one. But soon, Mr. Gruber was lost from view as a small brown figure sitting next to him raised a battered hat to the camera and hurried up the aisle after the Master of Ceremonies. If the Browns were overcome at the sight of Paddington climbing onto the stage, Ronnie Playfair was equally at a loss for words, which was most unusual. Uh, are you sure you're the right, Mr. Brown? He asked nervously as Paddington dumped his suitcase on the stage and raised his hat to the audience. Yes, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington, waving a piece of paper importantly in the air. I've got your letter asking me to come. Ah, uh, I, uh, I didn't know there were any bears in Notting Hill Gate, said Ronnie Playfair. I come from Peru, said Paddington, but I live in Windsor Gardens. Oh, well, said Ronnie Playfair, recovering himself slightly. Uh, well, we, we won't ask you to uh, peruse that, but I suppose we must expect the uh, bare facts tonight. <laughs> peruse that, he repeated, laughing at his own joke in a rather high voice. <laughs> bare facts. <laughs> his voice died away as he caught Paddington's eye. Paddington didn't think much of Ronnie Playfair's jokes, and he was giving him a particularly hard stare. Uh, well, uh, perhaps you'd like to step forward and uh, send a message home, said the Master of Ceremonies hurriedly. We always ask our contestants to uh, send a message home, and it, it, it makes them feel at ease. Paddington bent down and took a piece of paper out of his suitcase. Thank you very much, Mr. Playfair, he exclaimed, as he began advancing on the camera. The Browns watched in dumb fascination as Paddington loomed larger on their screen. Hello, all at number 32, said a familiar voice. I hope I shan't be late, Mrs. Bird. Mr. Gruber promised to bring me straight home at... Well, whatever else Paddington had been about to say was lost as there came a loud crash and the picture disappeared from the screen. Oh, no, cried Judy. Don't say it's broken down, not tonight of all nights. It's all right, said Jonathan. Look, they've got another camera on. 
As he spoke, another picture flashed onto the screen. It wasn't quite such a nice one as the close-up of Paddington had been, until just before the end, when it had suddenly gone soft and muzzy, that one had shown almost every whisker, whereas the new picture was looking towards the audience and there appeared to be some confusion. One of the cameramen was sitting on the floor, surrounded by wires and cables, rubbing his head, and Ronnie Playfair seemed to be having some kind of an argument with a man wearing headphones. He wasn't on his marks! cried the cameraman. He kept following me. You can't take proper close-ups if people don't stay on their marks. Paddington peered at the floor. My marks, he repeated hotly, but I had a bath before I came out. He doesn't mean dirt marks, said Ronnie Playfair, pointing to a yellow chalk line. He means that sort. You're supposed to stay where I put you, otherwise the cameras can't get their shots. You did ask me to step forward, said Paddington, looking most upset. I said, step forward, said Ronnie Playfair crossly, not go for a walk. Ronnie Playfair had been master of ceremonies on Lucky for Sam for several years with never a word out of place, let alone an upset like the one that had just occurred. And there was a strained look on his face as he picked his way back across the cables, closely followed by Paddington, who was peering anxiously at the floor in case he lost sight of his chalk mark again. Now, said Ronnie Playfair, as they reached the centre of the stage and stood facing the other cameras. Now, wh what would you like to be questioned on? He waved his hand in the direction of four barrels which stood in a row on a nearby table. You can have history, geography, mathematics or general knowledge. Paddington thought for a moment. I think I'd like to try my paw at mathematics, please he announced, amid applause from the audience. Crikey! exclaimed Jonathan. Fancy choosing maths! Knowing the way Paddington does the shopping, said Mrs Bird, I think it's a very wise choice. Paddington had a reputation among the street traders in the Portobello market for striking a hard bargain, and it was generally acknowledged that you had to get up very early in the morning indeed in order to get the better of him. I must say, he always keeps his accounts very neatly, said Mrs. Brown. I'm sure it's the right choice. Mathematics, repeated Ronnie Playfair. Well, we'd better look for the first question. He put his hand into one of the barrels and withdrew a piece of paper. A nice easy one to start with, he announced approvingly. And a very good question for a bear. If you get it right, there's a prize of five pounds. After a short roll of drums, Ronnie Playfair raised his hand for silence. For a prize of five pounds, he announced. How many buns make five? I must warn you, he added, winking at the audience, think carefully, it may be a trick question. Now, how many buns make five? Paddington thought for a moment. Two and a half, he replied. Ronnie Playfair's jaw dropped slightly. At two and a half, he repeated. Are you sure you won't change your mind? Two and a half, said Paddington firmly. Poor old Paddington, said Jonathan. Fancy getting the first one wrong. I am surprised, said Mrs Bird. It's not like him at all. Unless he's got something up his paw. Oh dear, said the Master of Ceremonies, as he picked up a hammer and struck a large gong by his side. Oh dear, I'm afraid you're out of the contest. The answer is five. I don't think it is, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington. It's two and a half. I always share my buns with Mr. Gruber when we have our elevenses, and I break them in half. Ronnie Playfair's jaw dropped even further, and the smile froze on his face. Y you share your buns with Mr. Gruber, he repeated. Give him the money, cried someone in the audience as the applause died down. You said it might be a trick question, cried somebody else amid laughter. Now you've got a trick answer. 
Ronnie Playfair fingered his collar nervously, and a strange look came over his face as he received a signal from the man wearing headphones to give Paddington the money. Are you going to stop now, Bear? he asked, hopefully, as he handed Paddington five crisp one-pound notes. Or do you want to go on for the next prize of fifty pounds? I'd like to go on, please, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington eagerly, as he hurriedly locked the money away in his suitcase. Oh, I shouldn't do that, said Ronnie Playfair, as he dipped his hand into the barrel and withdrew another piece of paper. If you get this question wrong, I shall want that five pounds back. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Brown. I feel all turned over inside. I hope Paddington doesn't do anything silly and lose his five pounds. He'll be so upset we shall never hear the last of it. Right, said Ronnie Playfair, holding up his hand once again for silence. For fifty pounds, here is question number two. And it's a two-part question. Now listen carefully. If, he said, if you had a piece of wood eight feet long and you cut it in half, and if you cut the two pieces you then half into half, and if you then cut all the pieces into half again, how many pieces would you have? Eight, said Paddington promptly. Very good, Bear, said Ronnie Playfair approvingly. Now, he continued, pointing to a large clock by his side, here is the second part of the question. Now, how long will each of the pieces be? You have ten seconds to answer, starting from now. Eight feet, said Paddington, almost before the master of ceremonies had time to start the clock. Eight feet, repeated Ronnie Playfair. You sure you won't change your mind? No, thank you, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington firmly. In that case, said Ronnie Playfair, as he triumphantly banged the gong, I must ask for the five pounds back. The answer is one foot. If I had a piece of wood, eight feet long, and I cut it in half, I would have two pieces, four feet long. And if I cut those in half, I would have four pieces, two feet long. And if I cut each of those in half, I would have eight pieces, one foot long. Having finished his speech, Ronnie Playfair turned and beamed a self-satisfied smile on the audience. You can't argue with that, Bear, he exclaimed. Oh, no, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington, politely. I'm sure that's right for your piece of wood. But I cut mine the other way. Well, once again, the smile froze on Ronnie Playfair's face. You... you did what? he exclaimed. I cut mine down the middle, said Paddington. So I had eight pieces eight feet long. Yeah, but... But, 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 but if, you're, if you're asked to cut a plank of wood in half, stuttered Ronnie Playfair, you cut it across the middle, not down the middle. It stands to reason. Not if you're a bear, said Paddington, remembering his efforts at carpentry in the past. If you're a bear, it's safer to cut it down the middle. Ronnie Playfair took a deep breath and forced a sickly smile to his face as he handed Paddington a large bundle of notes. I think you'll find they're all there, bare, he said stiffly, as Paddington sat down on the stage and began counting them. We're not in the habit of diddling people. Ronnie Playfair looked anxiously at his watch. The programme seemed to be taking a lot longer than usual. Normally, he would have got through at least five contestants by now. There are only five minutes left, he said. Do you want to go on for the final prize of five hundred pounds? Five hundred pounds, exclaimed Judy in a tone of awe. If I were Paddington, said Mrs Brown, I'd stop now and make sure of what I've got. The Browns grouped themselves even closer around their television screen as one of the cameras showed a close-up picture of Paddington considering the matter. I think I would like to carry on, Mr Playfair, he announced at last, amid a burst of applause. 
Although Paddington was not the sort of bear who normally believed in taking too many chances as far as money was concerned, he was much too excited by all that had taken place that evening to think clearly about the matter. Well, said Ronnie Playfair in his most solemn voice, here, for a prize of £500, is the last question of the evening. And this time, it's a much harder one. It would be, said Mrs Brown, holding her breath. If, continued Ronnie Playfair, if, if it takes two men, 20 minutes, to fill a 50-gallon bath full of water using one tap, how long will it take one man to fill the same bath using both taps? This time you've got 20 seconds starting from now. Ronnie Playfair pressed a button on the clock by his side and then stood back to await Paddington's answer. No time at all, Mr Playfair, said Paddington promptly. Wrong, exclaimed Ronnie Playfair as a groan came up from the audience. I'm afraid this time you really have got it wrong. It will take exactly half the time. I'm very sorry, Bear, he continued, looking most relieved as he gave the gong a bang with his hammer. Better luck next time. I think you must be wrong, Mr Playfair, said Paddington politely. Nonsense, said the Master of Ceremonies, giving Paddington a nasty look. The answer's on the card. In any case, it's bound to take some time. You can't fill a bath in no time at all. But you said it was the same bath, explained Paddington. The first two men had already filled it once, and you didn't say anything about pulling the plug out. Ronnie Playfair's face seemed to go a strange purple colour in the studio, and even on the Browns receiver it went several shades darker as he stared at Paddington. I didn't say anything about them pulling the plug out, he repeated, but of course they pull it out. You didn't say so, cried a voice in the audience as several boos broke out. That bear's quite right. Give him the money, cried someone else as several more voices added to the general uproar. Ronnie Playfair seemed to shudder slightly as he withdrew a silk handkerchief from his jacket pocket and patted his brow. Congratulations, Bear, he said grudgingly after a long pause. You've won the jackpot. What? exclaimed Paddington hotly as he gave Ronnie Playfair one of his hardest ever stares. I won a jackpot? I thought you said it was five hundred pounds. That is five hundred pounds, said Ronnie Playfair hastily. It's the top prize of all. That's why it's called a jackpot. Well, as the applause rang through the theatre, Paddington sat down in his suitcase, hardly able to believe his ears. Although he knew there must be five hundred pounds in the world, he had never, in his wildest dreams, thought he might one day see it in one big pile, let alone be told it was his. Ronnie Playfair held up his hand for silence. One final question. Before we end the programme, he exclaimed, and there's no prize for this one, <laughs> what are you going to do with all the money? Paddington considered the matter for a long time as the audience went very quiet. When you usually counted your money in terms of how many buns it would buy, it was very difficult even to begin to think about a sum like £500, let alone decide what to do with it. And when he tried to think of five hundred pounds worth of buns, he grew quite dizzy. I think, he said at last, as the camera came closer and closer, I think I would like to keep a little bit as a souvenir and to buy some Christmas presents. Then I would like to give the rest to the Home for Retired Bears in Lima. The home for retired bears in Lima, repeated Ronnie Playfair, looking most surprised. That's right, said Paddington. That's where my Aunt Lucy lives. She's very happy there, but I don't think they've got very much money. They only have marmalade on Sundays, so I expect they would find it very useful. 
Everyone applauded Paddington's announcement, and the applause grew louder still a few moments later when Ronnie Playfair announced on behalf of the television company that they would see to it that the home for retired bears in Lima was well supplied with marmalade for at least a year to come. After all, he said, it isn't every week a bear wins the jackpot in one of our quiz programs. Mrs. Bird paused for a moment and sniffed the air as she and Mrs. Brown turned the corner into Windsor Gardens. <laughs> Can you smell something? she asked. Mrs. Brown stopped by her side. Now Mrs. Bird mentioned it, there was a very peculiar odour coming from somewhere near at hand. It wasn't exactly unpleasant, but it was rather sweet and sickly, and it seemed to be made up of a number of things she couldn't quite place. Perhaps there's been a bonfire somewhere, she remarked as they picked up their shopping and continued along the road. Whatever it is, said Mrs. Bird darkly, it seems to be getting worse. In fact, she added, as they neared number 32, it's much too close to home for my liking. I knew it, she exclaimed as they made their way along the drive at the side of the house. Just look at my kitchen windows. Oh dear, said Mrs. Brown as she followed the direction of Mrs. Bird's gaze. What on earth has that bear been up to now? Looking at Mrs. Bird's kitchen windows, it seemed just as if in some strange way someone had changed them for frosted glass while they'd been out. Worse still, not only did the glass have a frosted appearance, but there were several tiny rivers of a rather nasty-looking brown liquid trickling down them as well. And from a small, partly open window at the top, there came a steady cloud of escaping steam. While Mrs. Bird examined the outside of her kitchen windows, Mrs. Brown hurried round to the back of the house. Oh, I do hope Paddington's all right, she exclaimed when she returned. I can't get in through the back door. It seems to be stuck. Hmm, said Mrs. Bird grimly. If the windows look like this from the outside, heaven alone knows what we shall find when we get indoors. Normally, the windows at number 32 Windsor Gardens were kept spotlessly clean, with never a trace of a smear. But even Mrs. Bird began to look worried as she peered in vain for a gap in the mist through which she could see what was going on. Had she but known, the chances of seeing anything at all through the haze were more unlikely than she'd imagined, for on the other side of the glass, even Paddington was having to admit to himself that things were getting a bit out of hand. In fact, as he groped his way across the kitchen in the direction of the stove, where several large saucepans stood bubbling and giving forth clouds of steam, he decided he didn't much like the look of the few things he could see. Climbing up on a kitchen chair, he lifted the lid off one of the saucepans and peered hopefully inside as he poked at the contents with one of Mrs. Bird's tablespoons. The mixture was much stiffer than he'd expected, and it was as much as he could manage to push the spoon in, let alone stir with it. Paddington's whiskers began to droop in the steam as he worked the spoon back and forth, but it wasn't until he tried to take it out in order to test the result of his labours that a really worried expression came over his face, for to his surprise, however much he pulled and tugged, it wouldn't even budge. The more he struggled, the hotter the spoon became, and after a moment or two, he gave it up as a bad job and hurriedly let go of the handle as he climbed down off the chair in order to consult a large magazine which was lying open on the floor. Making toffee wasn't at all the easy thing the article in the magazine had made it out to be, and it was all most disappointing, particularly as it was the first time he'd tried his paw at making sweets. The magazine in question was an old one of Mrs. Brown's, and he'd first come across it earlier in the day when he'd been at a bit of a loose end. Normally, Paddington didn't think much of Mrs. Brown's magazines. They were much too full of advertisements and items on how to keep clean and look smart for his liking, but this one had caught his eye because it was a special cookery number. 
It was the last article of all which had really made him sit up and take notice. It was called Ten Easy Ways with Toffee, and it was written by a lady called Granny Green, who lived in the country and seemed to spend all her time making sweets. Paddington had read the article several times with a great deal of interest, for although in the past he'd tried his port cooking various kinds of dinner, he'd never before heard of anyone making sweets at home, and it seemed a very good idea indeed. All Granny Green's recipes looked nice, but it was the last one of all for old-fashioned butter toffee that had really made Paddington's mouth water. Even Granny Green herself seemed to like it best, for in one picture she was actually caught helping herself to a piece behind her kitchen door when she thought no one was watching. It not only looked very tempting, but Paddington decided it was very good value for money as well. For apart from using condensed milk and sugar, all that was needed was butter, treacle, and some stuff called vanilla essence, all of which Mrs. Bird kept in her store cupboard. After checking carefully through the recipe once more, Paddington took another look at the magazine in the hope of seeing where he'd gone wrong, but none of the photographs were any help at all. All Granny Green's saucepans were as bright as a new pin, with not a trace of anything sticky running down the sides, and even her spoons were laid out neat and shining on the kitchen table. There was certainly no mention of any of them getting stuck in the toffee. In any case, her toffee was a light golden brown colour, and it was cut into neat squares and laid out on a plate, whereas from what he'd been able to make out of his own through the steam, it had been the colour of dark brown boot polish. And even if he had been able to get it out of the saucepans, he couldn't for the life of him think what he could cut it with. Paddington rather wished he'd tried one of the other nine recipes instead, and after heaving a deep sigh, he groped his way across the kitchen, and stretching up a paw, rubbed a hole in the steam on one of the window panes. As he did so, he jumped back into the middle of the room with a gasp of alarm, for there, on the other side of the glass, was the familiar face of Mrs. Bird. Mrs. Bird appeared to be saying something, and although he couldn't make out the actual words, he didn't like the look of some of them at all. Fortunately, before she was able to say very much, the glass clouded over again, and Paddington sat down in the middle of the kitchen floor with a forlorn expression on his face as he awaited developments. He hadn't long to wait, for a few moments later, there came the sound of footsteps in the hall. What on earth's been going on? cried Mrs. Bird as she burst through the door. Um, I've been trying my paw at toffee-making, Mrs. Bird, explained Paddington, sadly. Toffee-making? exclaimed Mrs. Brown as she flung open the window. Why, you could cut the air with a knife. That's more than you can say for the toffee, said Mrs. Bird, as she pulled at the end of the spoon Paddington had left in the saucepan. It looks more like glue. I'm afraid it is a bit thick, Mrs. Bird, said Paddington. I think I must have got my Granny Greens mixed up by mistake. I don't know about your Granny Greens, said Mrs. Bird grimly, as she surveyed the scene. It looks as if you got the whole pantry mixed up. I only cleaned the kitchen this morning, and now look at it. Paddington half stood up and gazed around the room. Now that most of the steam had cleared, it looked in rather more of a mess than he'd expected. There were several large pools of treacle on the floor and a long trail of sugar leading from the table to the stove, not to mention two or three half-open tins of condensed milk lying on their side where they'd fallen off the draining board. It's a job to know where to start, said Mrs. Brown as she stepped gingerly over one of the treacle pools. I've never seen such a mess. Well, we shan't get it cleared up if we stand looking at it, that's a certainty, said Mrs. Bird briskly as she bustled round, sweeping everything in sight into the sink. I suggest a certain young bear had better get down on his paws and knees with a scrubbing brush and a bowl of water before he's very much older. Otherwise, we shall all get stuck to the floor. Mrs. Bird paused. While she'd been talking, a strange expression had come over Paddington's face one which he didn't like the look of at all. Is anything the matter? she asked. 
I'm not sure, Mrs. Bird, said Paddington, as he made several attempts to stand up and then hurriedly sat down again, holding his stomach with both paws. I, I've got a bit of a pain. You haven't been eating this stuff, have you? exclaimed Mrs. Brown, pointing to the saucepans. Well, I did test it once or twice, Mrs. Brown, said Paddington. Gracious me, cried Mrs. Bird. No wonder you've got a pain. It's probably set in a hard lamp and you're inside. Try standing up again, said Mrs. Brown anxiously. I don't think I can, gasped Paddington as he lay back on the floor. I think it's getting worse. We could try a strong dose of castor oil, I suppose, said Mrs. Brown. I've a feeling it'll need more than castor oil, said Mrs. Bird ominously, as Paddington jumped up hurriedly with a feeling better expression on his face and then gave a loud groan as he promptly sat down again. Yes, I'll send for the ambulance. The ambulance, cried Mrs. Brown, going quite pale. Oh, dear, we should never forgive ourselves, said Mrs. Bird wisely, if anything happened to that bear. And so saying, she put her arms underneath Paddington and lifting him gently, carried him into the dining room and placed him on the sofa, where he lay with his legs sticking up in the air. Leaving Paddington where he was, Mrs. Bird disappeared, and when she returned she was carrying a small leather suitcase. I've packed all his washing things, she explained to Mrs. Brown, and I put in a jar of his special marmalade in case he needs it. Mrs. Bird mentioned the last item in a loud voice in the hope that it would cheer Paddington up, but at the mention of the word marmalade, a loud groan came from the direction of the sofa. Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird exchanged glances. If the thought of marmalade made Paddington feel worse, then things must be very bad indeed. I'd, uh, I, I, I'd better ring Henry at the office, said Mrs. Brown as she hurried into the hall. I'll, I'll get him to come home straight away. Fortunately, as Mrs. Brown replaced the telephone receiver, and before they had time to worry about the matter any more, there came sounds of a loud bell ringing outside, followed by a squeal of brakes and a bang on the front door. Ho, oh, ho, dear, said the ambulance man as he entered the dining room, saw Paddington lying on the sofa. Oh, what's this? I was told it was an emergency. Nobody said anything about it being a bear. Bears have emergencies the same as anyone else, said Mrs. Bird sternly. Now, just you bring your stretcher and hurry up about it. The ambulance man scratched his head. I don't know what they're going to say back at the hospital, he said doubtfully. They've got an outpatients and, and an inpatients department, but I've never come across a bear patients department before. Well, they're going to have one now, said Mrs. Bird. And if that bear isn't in it by the time five minutes is up, I shall want to know the reason why. The ambulance man looked nervously at Mrs. Bird and then back at the sofa as Paddington gave another groan. Mm, I must say, he doesn't look too good, he remarked. He's all right when he's got his legs in the air, explained Mrs. Brown. It's when he tries to put them down it hurts. The ambulance man came to a decision. The combination of Mrs. Bird's glares and Paddington's groans was too much for him. Bert, he called through the open door, fetch the number one stretcher and look slippy. We've got a young bear emergency in here. I don't much like the look of him. Nobody spoke in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Mrs. Bird, Mrs. Brown and the man in charge travelled in the back with Paddington and all the while his legs got higher and higher until by the time the ambulance turned in through the hospital gates they were almost doubled back on themselves. Even the ambulance man looked worried. Never seen anything like it before, he said. I'll cover him over with a blanket, ma'am, he continued to Mrs. Bird as they came to a stop. It'll save any uh, explanations at the door. We don't want too many delays filling in forms. Mrs. Brown and Mrs. Bird hurried in after the stretcher, but the ambulance man was as good as his word, and in no time at all, Paddington was being whisked away from them down a long white corridor. In fact, he only had time to poke a paw out from under the blanket in order to wave goodbye before the doors at the end of the corridor closed behind him, and all was quiet again. Oh dear, said Mrs. Brown as she sank down on a wooden bench. I suppose we've done all we can now. We can only sit and wait, said Mrs. Bird gravely, as she sat down beside her. Wait and hope.
The Browns and Mr. Gruber sat in a miserable group in the corridor as they watched the comings and goings of the nurses. Mr. Brown had arrived soon after the ambulance, bringing with him Jonathan and Judy, and shortly after that Mr. Gruber had turned up, carrying a bunch of flowers and a huge bag of grapes. They're from the traders in the market, he explained. They all seem their best wishes and hope he gets well soon. It won't be long now, said Mr. Brown, as several nurses entered the room at the end of the corridor. I think things are beginning to happen. As Mr. Brown spoke, a tall, distinguished-looking man, dressed from head to foot in green, came hurrying down the corridor and, with a nod in their direction, disappeared through the same door. That must be Sir Mortimer Carraway, said Judy, knowledgeably. That ambulance man said he's the best surgeon they have. Crikey, said Jonathan in a tone of awe. Fancy Paddington having him. Quite right, too, said Mrs. Bird, decidedly. There's nothing like going to the top. People at the top are always more understanding. I feel so helpless, said Mrs. Brown, voicing the thoughts of them all as they sat on the bench and prepared themselves for a long wait. They were each of them busy with their own thoughts, and although not one of them would have admitted it to the others, even the knowledge that such a famous person as Sir Mortimer Carraway was in charge didn't help matters. "'Good heavens!' exclaimed Mr. Brown a few minutes later, as the door at the end of the corridor opened once again, and the figure of Sir Mortimer appeared. "'That was quick!' Mrs. Brown clutched her husband's arm. "'You don't think anything's gone wrong, do you, Henry?' she asked. "'We shall soon know,' said Mr. Brown, as Sir Mortimer caught sight of them, and came hurrying along the corridor, holding a piece of fur in his hand. "'Are you that uh, young bear's uh, uh, um, next of kin?' he asked. "'Well, he lives with us,' said Mrs. Brown. "'He is going to be all right,' exclaimed Judy, looking anxiously at the piece of fur. "'I should think,' said Sir Mortimer in a grave voice, but with the suspicion of a twinkle in his eye, "'I should think there's every chance he'll pull through.' "'Gracious me!' exclaimed Mrs. Bird, as there was a sudden commotion at the end of the corridor. "'There is Paddington! Don't tell me he's up already!' "'A bad case of galloping toffee drips,' said Sir Mortimer. "'Most unusual. On the stomach, too. Worst possible place.' "'Galloping toffee drips?' repeated Mr. Brown. "'I think I must have spilt some on my fur when I was testing it, Mr. Brown,' explained Paddington, as he joined them. They probably set when he was sitting down, said Sir Mortimer. <laughs> no wonder he couldn't get up again. Sir Mortimer chuckled at the look on everyone's face. I'm afraid he'll have a bare patch for a week or so, but I don't doubt if you keep him on a diet of marmalade for a while, it'll soon start to grow again. Should be all right by Christmas. Oh, if you don't mind, Bear, he said, as he made to leave. If you don't mind... I'd like to keep this piece of fur as a souvenir. I've done a good few operations in my time, but I've never had a bear's emergency before.